Okay, so um, what, I'd, what I'd like to do now is briefly talk about desire. Ibn Arabi says about desire here in this uh, poem that's in the Fusus and also in his Diwan, very short. It's tough to translate. Wahak, uh, yeah, the by the truth, by the right of desire or love. Desire is itself the cause of desire. And were it not for desire in the heart, desire or love would not be worshipped. I, I won't expand on that at this time. And another thing he has to say about desire, another lovely poem, is he says, I've I've been a slave of love, of desire, and it uh and, and desire ruled over me. Hakim, it was, it was my ruler. So today I have more right to be called by its name. You know, call me by call me by his name, call me by her name. It's his name. I've been a slave of love and it's ruled over me. And so today, after this long period of servitude uh, to love, I have more right to be called uh, by its name, to be called a lover or to be called even love itself. Then he has this uh, poem, which is itself bewildering. Then he has this poem which uh, from his Diwan, which um, really connects love and bewilderment. And this one is, it's really short and simple in Arabic, but it's like impossible to translate into English well because of all of the multiple possible meanings there. So I, I apologize, but I put the Arabic there. If any of you know Arabic or you want to try, have chat GPT translated for you. Uh, so something you can see the other possibilities that that that, that are there. Um, so it's love bewildered me in that which it could be that which you know, that which it knows, that which, yeah. So, but basically, love bewildered me in that which is known, or some, so you know, something that uh, is is known, or it could be love bewildered me in that which I know of it, or not I, that which you know of it. Um, so even the the statement about love being bewildering is itself bewildering because of the different possibilities of the Arabic form. So when I say I. He, and I read this here as love, says, I don't know it. If I say I, love's that, who's that? Um, and if I say Bala, nay, he says, yeah, that I understand. And this is, could be, I mean, to reference a lot of different things, but um, in the Quran on the day of Allah, when God says, Allah to be Rabbikum, humanity's reply is Bala Shahidna. So God says, am I not your Lord? And we say, Bala is a response to like a negative rhetorical question. So it's yes. So if somebody says, am I not, is it not the case that something, the response is Bala. Nay, it is true, something like that in English. So this Bala, if I say Bala, uh, he could be referring to this primordial covenant with God. And God says, am I not your Lord? And we say, yes. So if I say I, God's like, who's that? Love or love says, who's that? If I say Bala, he's like, yeah, that I understand. That I'll accept. I am not other than love. I'm not other than love. And so I uh, judge it, rule it. Love expresses what keeps making it unclear. So this, this Yorabu and Ajam, they're opposites in, in Arabic. So love keeps expressing, making clear the very thing which makes it unclear. So for us, everything that he says to me clarifies it. And this this thing, uh, uh, yeah, everything he says to me is clarifying, clar clarifies it. But this is also a reference to the uh, some verses of the Quran that are called clear or called muhkam, this word here. So these are the verses that are supposed to be clear. So everything that God says to me to clarify, or everything that love says to, to express itself makes it obscure. And so everything that he says is clear. So this is paradox on paradox on, on paradox. So he says, like this, he knows me, my Lord, who's mastered it, it, love. For by him, I manifest it, and for him, I conceal it. I am the slave whose star has fallen. And this is a reference to the Quran. When the star, when it falls, and fall in Arabic here, Hawa is... It comes from the same root as love. Hawa. The command seeks that whose trait is earth. And the command here, al-amr, 
is in Sufi terminology a term for the spiritual. So you have the world of the Amar, the world of the command, the world of the spirits, and you have the world of like bodies and physical things. So he says the command seeks that whose trait is earth. The spiritual is seeking that which is low, that which is the body. And therefore I'm fair or just in all the ways that I've wronged or shadowed it. The command, possibly, love. He said the very thing that clarified it is the same as what obscured it. And this eye here can also be the eye. The very eye that clarified it, that sees it clearly, is the same as the eye that obscures it or overshadows it. So if I praise it, I speak to him. And this is another one that could be translated in four different ways. And the one who breaks me, I establish him. So he never sees me conclude it, conclude love, or he never sees me tired of him or tired of it. So this is a typical Ibn Arabi poem that introduces a subject in which each line has like five different meanings and it's very confusing. It's not clarifying, but in a certain sense, when you go through and read what comes after it, it actually is clarified. So it's, it's, it's what he says, everything he says about it makes it more obscure, but also clarifies it. Anyway, so I, I think hopefully after we get through this, next what we read what we're going to read in the breakout groups the poem will become a little bit uh a little bit more clear all right so he says all praise be to god alhamdulillah, who made love a sanctuary towards which the hearts of all men whose spiritual education is complete make their way and a kaaba around which the secrets of the chests of men of spiritual refinement revolve so love is those whose spiritual education is complete, they turn to love. Love is the postdoc. Love is the master class. Love is the, love is, uh, like I said, it's the Kaaba around which the secrets of the chat, the, in, in the chest of people of spiritual refinement revolve. Um, so kind of love is, is, is the point of all of this. Or this, this love, this, this hawa. In his, uh, he has a chapter on love in the Futuhat, Ibn Arabi does, and he talks about four, there are lots of different words for love, like there are like, I don't know, 60 some different words for love in Arabic, including Rahma, mercy. And so every chapter of the Quran starts out, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, name of God, the all merciful, all compassionate, but both merciful and compassionate come from this root word, mercy, which as a hadith says, it's like what a mother feels toward a child. And so that's that's definitely love. And Ibn Arabi brings that out, that Rahma is love. But in poetry and in his writing generally, he talks about four different words for love and goes through their etymologies. So you have Hawa, which comes from falling, wind. It's like the, when a falcon strikes its prey, that kind of, kind of thing. So it's just the feel of falling in love. Uh, we, in even English, we say falling in love, that kind of feeling of, you know, the ground gives way beneath you and you're, you know, that vert that's hawa. Um, but in the Quran, it's also means something like caprice or like lusts or passions or things like that in, in a negative sense. So sometimes it's translated as passion. Sometimes it's translated as caprice or lust. And that, so that's, that's hawa. Then um, he talks about hub, which comes from the same root as hib, meaning seed. And so the idea is it's kind of like this love, you fall in love, the seed falls and it's planted in the earth. And you have this hib, the seed there that's planted and it's this tiny thing, but it grows. And it's very constant. All of the life is concentrated in its one thing in hub. And so hub is really, it's a central Quranic term for, for love. Hub, H-U-B-B, -B, hub, hub like hub, but hub. Um, so that's, that's hub. That's so, you know, this, if you love God, then follow me. That's hub uh, that's being talked about. The, those who believe are more intense in God, that's hub that's being talked about, that kind of love. And so this kind of love contains a lot of things within it, just like a seed does. So it's you know, the love that people have for each other romantically in friendship and all kinds of things. It's all hub. Then there's uh, ishq, which is this is this kind of passionate, all-consuming, romantic love. It was what was used to translate the Greek eros. And so, and the creative etymology of ishq is ishq is this vine that would wrap itself around the tree and choke it out, and so there'd be just the vine standing there. And so, so this is what ishq does. 
it's just this all consuming love it comes up and it takes over all of you and so there's no more you and there's just there's just the ish there's just the love yeah so it's radical love passion eros things like that ishk. so in, in the persian in urdu in these turkish and other languages ishka is the main term that they use if you've ever seen a bollywood movie it's all ishka this ishka that right so it's this passionate intense love that's usually erotic in, in connotation there was a big debate in sufi circles about can you apply ish to god because it's not in the quran can you say you have yashik can you have ish for god can god have ish for people whereas hope obviously god talks you know says he has hope in the quran then there's another uh word wad which uh one of god's names is al wadud the loving and this word comes from it means a, a like a peg a tent it's firm it's stable so it's this firmly established love so mawadda is like firmly established love intimacy closeness it's like you've been with somebody for a long time you just sit on the couch you gotta watch a movie you don't need to say anything it's like you know you've, been, you've had a friend for a really long time or a life partner it's a really firmly established love and so ibn Arabi says that's why of all the names that God takes for himself in, in the Quran, he calls Wadud because he's fixed and established and firm in love. You know, he's not new to this, he's true to this. He's, he's, he's you know, he's he's really established in, in, in love. And so this these are the different kind of terms for love and the different shades that they have. Glad, yeah, I'm glad you asked that. Because Hawa, that's why some places you translate it as desire, because it has this like, you know reaching out for things, desiring things. But from one point of view, Ibn Arabi says they're different. And then as you can expect from another point of view, it's like it's all, it's all the same. But yeah, thank you. Um, that's really helpful. Yep. Yeah, the, the discrimination comes in. Also, what is it that you're love? What, what's the problem in loving them? And not always there's no problem in there. The problem is in your recognition, your awareness of what's going on when you're loving them. If you're not aware of what's going on, just like when you're not aware of when you're walking down the street or something, you're going to bump into things, you're going to have problems. If you're aware of what's going on, then you'll be in a better state. And then it's no obstacle. And nobody can avoid love. So whoever sees love as an obstacle in the spiritual path and is trying to do spiritual work without love, nah, you're going to fall for it. You can't avoid love. There's no escaping desire. There's no escaping love. Um, so what you have to do is understand what it is, how it's working, which is, I think, now we can turn to these um, tafsirs of these uh, of these ones. So one I didn't include here, but it's it's not Ibn Arabi. It's from an uh, earlier Persian Sufi, Mebudi, which Shirek has also translated. So this one, among the people are some who take peers apart from God, loving them as if loving God. But those who believe are more intense in love for God, if only those who were unjust um, could see, uh, they would see that the punishment that all power is God's and God is intense in punishment. So this, this verse, uh, Mebudi tells a funny story. He says there was a man who saw a woman who was extremely beautiful. And he said, oh, I'm so in love with you. My all is busy with your all. I'm like, let's, let's do this. You know, this is you're incredibly beautiful. And she's, oh, no, 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 no. I have a sister who's even more beautiful than me and she's like oh really can I meet her and she said ah, I knew it you you don't actually love me you don't actually love me you just you're interested in your own your own thing if you're a real lover you give your give your whole self and tells it and he also says learn love from a dog and the dog its master gives it food and it barks and it's happy its master hits it and it comes back and it's happy he said this is this is love not the love of oh I only like when things go well I only like when I'm happy. I only like when I hear things that I like. He says, learn love from a dog. And that's Mebudi's commentary on this verse. Now, I found this uh, an anonymous tafsir that I think it's it's in the tradition of, of Ibn Arabi. So, because um, it borrows a lot from him. And then we'll go to Ibn Arabi's own statements on these. So it says, um, on this verse, nothing but God is loved and nothing but God is worshipped. So Ibn Arabi famously interprets this verse, your Lord has decreed that you worship none but him, not as a prescriptive command, like saying you people only worship God, but as a descriptive command that only God is worshipped in every form of worship. Whether you realize it or not, what you're worshipping is the non-delimited real in things. And because indeed nothing but God really is, nothing but God is real. 
However, some people limit their love of God to a particular form or forms of his. Right? So you got, like we talked about, the idols created in belief. You got this particular idea of what big guy, white guy in the clouds with a beard, wrathful, vengeful person who punishes your enemies, all loving person with no wrath, no anger at all. Right? That's another conceptual construction of God. All these different things, different idols. So some people limit their love of God to these particular forms. But, and so those who love God in these limited forms, in idols or in peers and dadan, they love a limited form, and so their love is limited. Right? Like, uh, I can't love, or normally I can't love an iPhone as much as I love a person. So the iPhone is like more delimited. I can't love a picture normally. Yeah, I'm sure nowadays people, because, but anyway, normally you can't love a picture of a person more than a person because the person's more capacious and real, so that the kind of love is more intense. So the people who love these and dad and these peers love a limited form, and so their love is limited. But those who love God, the believers, and God, God who's beyond all limitation, and God is so beyond all limitation, he's even beyond the limitation of being beyond limitation, because that's still to say he's like up there, out there. God's even beyond that. So he takes on all these delimitations. That's all these different forms. And they love him in each and every form without limitation. So those who believe love God in each and every form. They recognize him and love him in each and every form. Thus, their love is unlimited. It's not delimited to this form, that form, this appearance of God, that appearance of God. And so it's thus more intense. He loves them and, and they love him. They love him with God's love. Those who love the idols of a particular form or forms only love as if with the love of God, kahub. Right? So it's still, it's kind of virtual connection to it, but it's more indirect. It's an as if, as opposed to with God's love. So those who believe, so for those who believe, who for whom the love of God is not limited by these forms, they love God with his own unlimited love. That is, God loves himself through them. So those who, now this volamu uh, in Arabic, and Ibn Arabi does this sometimes, it literally means to wrong yourself, to oppress yourself, to overshadow. Uh, so it usually, it usually means to like do bad things, right? To oppress, to wrong, to harm. But those who harm themselves can also be those who discipline themselves. Or those who overshadow themselves, those who negate themselves in the divine. You know, the moth wrongs itself by flying into the flame, right? Um, so those who, um, oh, that's not this, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. But anyway, so those, those who, um, one way of, one way of doing it, like, uh, Ahab suggested by interpreting this is those who wrong themselves when they see this intense, the intensity of, of, of the, 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 the severity of the process of self-negation of expanding yourself beyond these, these limited concepts of going beyond and of flying into the candle flame. They see that all the power is God's. Right? For the moth, the candle flame is all powerful. And that God is intense in this kind of, that, that experience of going into the candle flame is, is rough. Like, love is never easy. Love always implies a kind of death, a death of your ego. You know, if you have kids, if you have a relationship, you know, love always requires sacrifice of, of your own ego, of your own self. And that's intense. And, and the more intense the love is, the more intense the sacrifice. So I remember when I was a kid, I, you know, I loved my parents. I loved my brothers. That was intense. And I got married and I was more than I had kids. And it was just like another level of intensity of self-sacrifice. And... God is, so if that's what it's like for people, God is really, really intense in that kind of, so anyway, that was a little tangent. I didn't mean to go on, but those who wrong themselves in the typical way of just like, lip, they wrong themselves by limiting their love to a particular form of forms. If they could only see, they would know the intense sweetness, sweet pain, as we said before, adab or dab, same root, just a tiny little inflection. So you'd know the intense sweet pain of love, unlimited love. And the severe punishment of uh, limited love. 
especially when compared to the sweetness of unlimited love. So the pain of regret and envy is this severe punishment. Now, when you see unlimited love, when you're aware of unlimited love and you're aware of the limitations of your own love, that's this that creates this pain of envy and regret of, which Ibn Arabi and other loads of Sufi commentators describe as the, the pain of hell for them a lot of times in some places uh, is described as on that day, your sight is piercing. So you see the reality of what things are. And then you realize your limited place compared to what it could have been. So that's that's one way of coming at this, coming at this verse. God is intense in sweet pain. And those who wrong themselves by limit limiting this, if they could only see what was really going on, or when they see what's really going on, then they'll that's when it hurts. I'm, I'm, so it's like if you're at the Grand Canyon and you're looking at your phone, you're just scrolling through your phone, right? And you're unaware that, you know, it's like, uh, let's say you, you go to the Grand Canyon at sunrise, it's dark, and so you're just playing on your phone. Then the sun comes up. You're still playing on your phone, and you, you're so addicted you can't raise your head from your phone. You're aware that there's this beautiful scenery there that you want to look at, but you can't because you're stuck to you're stuck to your phone. That's what dying is like. It's like the sun comes up. You can see everything for certain. You have an awareness that there's something beyond what you're looking at, but you can't pull your head up out of your phone to look. So then you you regret that everybody around you is ooing and eyeing and like, wow, this is wonderful. And you're scrolling Instagram still. Right. So that's it's you don't have to the, the transition from this life to the next life. That's. You know, most of the time, that's not by choice. It's like you don't have to do this turn in order to feel the regret. And then even to feel the the kind of the, the delimitation, it's like you 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 put yourself in a box, and you you feel that delimitation even if you ignore it. But then when you realize you're in a box, like when you die, when the, when the Quran says your sight is piercing, that's everybody's sight is piercing. It describes people seeing the. That's when you you realize the state that you're in. That's when you realize the hell you've been putting yourself through, and and all of this stuff. Which is what pain does, and which I don't know if I if, if I mentioned this earlier, but it not to be explains that wrath and mercy are the same thing; they're the same substance. Wrath and mercy are the same thing. So wrath is just an intense form of mercy meant to drive you from a lower form of mercy to a higher, more enjoyable form of mercy. So in the, the fuss of the chapter on Dawood, he explains this with like chainmail because David was supposed to invent a chainmail. Chainmail and swords are made from the same material. And so there's a famous Sufi saying that says, hell is a whip that drives people towards heaven. Right, so suffering and pain, it's, it's really kind of the other side of love. Love is wanting what you don't have. Suffering is wanting what you have to go away and wanting something else. So the, the wrath drives you towards more intense mercy. So it's just a form of mercy that drives you towards more intense mercy. Um, but it, it's a pain that's going to make you want to move. That's going to make you want to change. That's going to make you want to be in a different situation. That's, 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 what, that's, what, that's what punishment is. Yeah, like I said at the, at the beginning, when uh, he says, when you love someone, you don't punish them. The only You punish them only to teach them something and to help them. So the punishment isn't a merely retributive, like, you did this bad, therefore we're going to do this. It's, it's functional. It's like tests. As a teacher, I give tests to help people learn things, not just, not just to, uh, not just to, not, yeah, not just to, not just to be like, okay, here, you're I, now I know you're you're at level, you're at this level. But I set the test in order so the students study, in order so that they learn, in order so that they they, they do it. So it's it's a functional kind of thing. It's supposed to move you. Um, so these tests, these trials in this life, and the punishment in the next life, if not to be in again with everything, he has lots of different ways of talking about. It. One important way that he talks about it is in terms of development, like cooking you, you get cooked. So uh, moving on to, this is Ibn Arabi himself commenting on the second verse and the one who's taken caprice or desire or love as his God. So he says, okay, and this is from the chapter on Aaron, Fas Harun, uh, in the context of talking about the Israelites worshiping the golden calf. So he says, the, have you seen the one who's taken, uh, him who has taken desire for his God? 
He says, the greatest and most exalted locus of self-disclosure, wherein he is worshipped, God is worshipped, is that of desire. So the, the most perfect, the best, the grandest, the clearest mirror in which God displays his reflection for our people to worship is in the mirror of love. It's not just a desire for God. It's just it's just desire because also God's not a particular thing. Um, so he says, he, he, he'll, uh, he, he explains it further. So remember, he said, have you seen him who has taken his desire for his God? It is the greatest object of worship since nothing is worshiped except through it. And it is only worshipped by itself. Okay, so nothing is worshipped unless you want to worship it. Right? Whether it's, like we say, cars, fame, bad things, good things, whatever. Golden calves, idols, enlightenment, whatever is worshipped. Right? Everything that's worshipped is worshipped through desire. So this is what you said. The truth of desire is that desire is the cause of desire. If not for the desire in the heart, desire would not be worshipped. So he says, don't you see how perfect God's knowledge of things is, how he perfects one who worships his desire and takes it as his divinity, right? So he's saying this is a perfect thing. He sees this worshiper worshiping only his desire, complying with its command to worship the individual whom he worships. Even his worship of God comes from his desire. Right? If you didn't have desire for the divine, which is a will based on love, you wouldn't worship God nor would you prefer him to another one. Right? So even your worship of God comes through desire. And from another point of view, God is identical with desire. Desire is the, yeah, all desire is God's and desire is the uh, God's best mirror. Or you can say it's God himself really, kind of some places. So he says, anyone who worships some form of the world and makes it a divinity, does so only because of desire. So you make money your divinity, that's because of desire. If you decide to worship money over God, that's out of desire. If you decide to worship God over money, that's also out of desire. So the only thing that's worshiped in both cases is desire. All right, so he says the, the worshiper is forever under the influence of his desire. So and this is brought up really well in that second poem. Um, you're always under the influence of desire. You can't escape it. Now, he sees the objects of worship diversified amongst the worshipers. Each one who worships something denies one who worships something else. Right. So we're here in the Ibnarabi society. We're like, yeah, worship God or like the non-delimited real, or, you know, whatever else. These people who worship money, you shouldn't worship money or you worship power. You shouldn't do that. And those people who worship power are like, no, you guys are crazy. You're in your little la-la land with your crazy Sufi concepts and whatever. Power is what's really thing. You should worship power. Right. Or whatever else, somebody's got their own, uh, I don't know, Osho cult or something. We've got their own cult and like this figure, this guy, this is it. You know, you should leave aside these other traditions and whatever. This guy's got the answer. You should worship this thing. Right. So all of these, the objects of desire, the objects of worship are diversified. Everybody worships something. Everybody worships something. There's no escaping worshiping something and uh, denies the one who worships something else. But Anyone who has the least bit of awareness will be bewildered at the unanimity of desire, nay, by the oneness of desire, for it's the same essence in every worshiper. Every worshiper, everybody who worships desires, you got different things that you worship, but everybody who worships, worships out of the same thing, that desire, and it's the same desire in every single person for worshiping. So it's the same thing animating the worship of money, animating the worship of fame, animating the worship of God, animating the worship of whatever is worshipped. It's the same reality, desire. So it's bewildering because you've got all these different objects of worship, but they're all being worshipped through the same one thing, desire, which is identical in every worshipper. Even though they're all turned towards different directions, the thing that's taking them there is the same. But uh, the, the rest, the, the next section in this deals with this about like, okay, so what about the prophet with the idolater? So this is in the um, the context of Aaron is talking about, you know, people worshiping the golden calf. And there's a similar discussion in the chapter on Noah uh, about the people who are like, hey, did you make all the gods one god? This is weird. So, so anyway, so he, he, he says that God led him astray, the one who's taking desire for his god. That is bewildered him. So being led astray here is to be bewildered. 
not to not to have you know gone or off the gone or down the wrong path, but to have gone beyond paths. So God bewildered him, led him astray, which has bewildered him out of knowledge. Which in the thing it says, you know, um, I think it's ala. Yeah, God led him astray ala al-ilm, ala al which is could be he led him astray away from knowledge, or he led him astray by his own knowledge, or he led him astray. And so this is, he's led him astray out of this knowledge that every worshiper only worships his own desire. So once you realize this, you're bewildered. You see everybody worshiping the same thing, but yet they're worshiping such different things and they're fighting with each other. And that's bewildering. How can the same thing, how can the same thing be so different? And all these different things be the same thing. And so only seeks to worship his desire, whether, and everybody only seeks to worship his own desire, whether or not it uh, coincides with the prescribed command. This is this question about shirk. It goes against the prescribed command. But people, everybody who does it does it out of desire. People who follow the prescribed command, the revelation, they only do that out of, out of desire too. So everything that's being worshipped is, is desire. The perfect knower is the one who sees every object of worship as a self-disclosure, a sight of self-disclosure, a sight, a mirror in which God shows his reflection of the real wherein to worship him. So he, he goes on to explain that um, you... In the case of the prophet, for example, the prophet recognized that everybody was worshiping idols in Mecca, was only worshiping idols out of desire, or really the, the or I think that the next one will really kind of clarify it. They were, they were really just worshiping, they were sites, mirrors set up in which they were perceiving something of God and them, and that's what they were worshiping you know, out, out of this, out of this unanimous desire. But going back to the first one, they're limited, they're restricted, but the one who's who is led astray like this, the one who really knows, his knowledge of God is not limited to a particular mirror. Right? It'd be weird if you recognize your face in one mirror and not another. And it's something, or if you're, um, you know, if you use the God's coming to you with different dresses on, if you're like, oh, I recognize in this dress, not that dress, you're not recognizing God, you're re recognizing the dress. Right? So, these the the problem with the idols and these things is that they're they're limited, and they're the limited and therefore limiting. And so, so he says in in Fas Harun he says so the the prophet even though the prophets and those who follow them amongst the knowers even though they recognize that people are all the people are doing is just worshiping God, in them, he says they conform to the command of the moment, which is at the moment this is the thing that's go, that God is doing to try to break people out of. The limited and delimiting things so you oppose outwardly you oppose the idolaters whether people worshiping stones or people worshiping their egos whatever but you oppose them even though inwardly you recognize that they're worshiping the same thing that you are out of the same force that you are oh actually this the most this is actually perfect for this so rumi's moses and story people usually stop it at so the story of Moses and Khidr is like there's a shepherd who's um who's a uh, uh, sorry uh, Moses and the shepherd or Moses and Khidr sorry <laughs> Moses and the shepherd but it's but it's a it's a Khidri story so Moses is uh Moses comes across the shepherd who's like talking to God it's like oh God I'll pick the burrs out of your fur I'll like you know uh whatever clip 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 your hooves take the lice out of this I'll brush your brush your hair and shear your fur like and Moses is like whoa 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 what do you this is not a proper way to talk to God God is the creator of all the universe God doesn't have hair God doesn't have feet that you need to do this no this is this is not befitting the respect and dignity uh do due, due to God you know this is theologically absurd uh this is not this is not the proper way to worship God and the shepherd feels really bad because he's you know an educated guy and he's like oh I'm sorry then Moses goes off. Then God comes and talks to Moses. He's like, what's wrong with you? Did I send you to bring Vasla fast? Did I send you to separate, to unite or to separate? That everybody has a language. Everybody has a way of addressing me. This is my beloved servant who is addressing me in a way that I love. And uh, I love to hear from him. You have your own way of worship. Shame on you for doing this. It really comes in very hard and chastises Moses. And that's where most translations in English end. But that's not the end of the story in the Masnavi. So then Moses goes back to the shepherd and says, I'm sorry, man, I was my bad. God said, you know, I shouldn't have said this to you. You go ahead and worship God in the way you were doing before. God likes it. It's all good. I'm sorry. But the shepherd says, no, no, no. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so, so much. He said, you like, 
cracked the whip and uh, my horse, the horse of my soul shied and jumped beyond the cosmos and, 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 and went, went far beyond. And where I am now, you can't even understand. I'm speaking, but I'm not really speaking. When the flute, when you play the flute, it's not the flute that's coming, it's the flute, it's the breath from the player that's coming through it. And the Moses is thrown into bewilderment <laughs> as well to, as well too. So it's, God was using, well, God was, yeah, again, it's, it's so bewildering. It's like, what's an error? What's providential? What's, so the, the, the shepherd was doing one thing. Most shepherd was one way. Moses was another way. God knocked them against each other to make, to break both of them out of their limited understandings of God and worship of God. And it's, it's exactly this dynamic of bewilderment. So the one who's kind of already, who's already like the shepherd, you know, if you become like that shepherd or like Moses at the end of the story, you're already bewildered. You recognize this is what you see is going on, but you still will knock against other people in order to outwardly you'll knock against other people, chastise or get chastised or whatever, because it's all part of the process of breaking out of your own particular limitations, delimited understandings of God and therefore yourself and your form of worship and all of that. Yeah, so thank you. It's a, it's a wonderful illustration of 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 this as usual rumi does it in this kind of dramatic fashion ibn arabi is doing it in this associative quranic philosophical argumentation style right so you see this verse now looks very different given everything we've learned about love and bewilderment and all of that and then okay we still have uh Time. So Chidik concludes in, in this, this passage from the Futuhat uh, in his article, Divine Roots of Human Love, something that I think brings both of these uh, verses together, Ibn Arabi's understanding of both of these verses uh, together. So it says, this is why a human being, being doesn't become totally annihilated and raptured by love, except in his love for his Lord, because right? anything else is too delimited, too limited to take all of you, or for someone who is the locus of self-disclosure for his Lord. That is another human being. So human being, you can only be annihilated in love. The, the only thing that can take your all, the all of your being in love, is another person or God. Anything else is too small. The entities of the cosmos are all lovers because of him. Whatever the beloved may be, since all created things are pedestals for the real self-disclosure. Their love is fixed and they are loving and he is the loving. The whole situation is concealed between the real and creation, through creation and the real. That's why God brought the name. So forgiving means to like, uh, means can also mean to like let down a curtain. That's why God brought the name forgiving along with the name loving in the Quran. In the verse, he is, he is the forgiving, the loving, the Lord of the throne, the glorious. So this thing, love brings this kind of concealment or curtaining between the real and, and, and creation even as it connects it. Uh, after all, forgiving, forgiving, yeah, he says here, literally means curtaining. Uh, thus it is said that the famous lovers Qais and Layla, uh, Qais is uh, Majnun's given name. So Majnun loved Layla, since Layla derives from the locus of the disclosure. In the same way, this Bisha, another famous lover of Arabic literature and poetry, loved Hind, Kuthair loved Aza, Ibn al Duraj loved Lubna, Toba loved al uh, Akhyaliya, and Jamil loved Buthayna. All of these women were pedestals through which the real disclosed himself to them. So all these famous Romeo and Juliet like lovers, right? Juliet was the site of disclosure of God's beauty and Romeo was the site of disclosure of God's love and vice versa too. So the beloved is, is a pedestal even if the lover is ignorant of the names of what he loves. So he says, you know, somebody, a man can see a woman and love her without knowing who she is, what her name is, who her relatives are, and where she lives. But love by its essence requires that he seek out her name, her home, so that he may attend to her and know her in the state of her absence through the name and relationship. Thus, he will, he will ask about her if he lacks the witnessing of her. And this goes back to the earlier poems that we read about. Where did they go? What's going on? Da, 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 da. So is our love for God. We love him in his loci of self-disclosure, where God, in the mirrors in which he reveals himself, and within the specific name, which can be Layla or Lubna or whatever. But we don't recognize that the object is identical with the real. So we fall in love with Layla, with Lubna, whatever. Layla falls in love with Qais. 
but they don't always recognize who it is they're falling in love with. You have the name, but not necessarily the, the, the reality. So here we love the name, but we don't recognize that it's identical with the real. Thus we love the name and we don't recognize the entity. In the case of the created thing, you know the entity and you love it. In the case of Layla, Pace, whatever. It may be that the name is not known. However, love refuses anything but making the beloved known. Among us are those who know God in this world, and among us are those who do not know him until they die while loving some specific thing. Right, so I can die loving Layla, I can die loving BMWs, whatever. Then they will come to understand when the covering is lifted that they had only loved God. They had loved only God, but they had been veiled by the name of the created thing. Right, so these beloved things, all the things that we love are pedestals to which we love God, or curtains that come down. And some of us can see through the curtain and be like, oh, all this, all the stuff I love is just God. It's all just God that I'm loving. And so in this life, some of us don't, and it takes until the curtain is, comes up after we die. And then we're like, oh, oh, it was all, okay. All these things that, that I loved were, were really God. And this is really kind of everything we've been discussing today, the bewilderment, passion, and escapability of passion, transcending forms and bewilderment and all of this stuff, and God being the only one loved, and is summed up in what's now Ibn Arabi's most famous and most popular poem, you know, qalbi kabilan kulla suratin. My heart became receptive to every form, a meadow for gazelles, a monastery for monks, a temple for the idols, a Kaaba for the pilgrim, the tablets of the Torah, the pages of the Quran. My religion is love's religion, so ever her caravans turn. Bewilderment. That religion is my religion and my faith. We have an example of this in Hinds, Bishr, and others, in Qais and Layla, and Maya and Ghilan, these famous lovers. So this is kind of cited as a kind of like, if not we coexist bumper sticker, or like Kumbaya, but it's, 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 it's way more than this. It's very, very different from that. What he's talking about is precisely this bewilderment is transcending all of the limitations through following, you know, prophetic guidance. It's much more than like, kumbaya, let's all get along. Like, you're a Sikh, I'm a Muslim, you're a Jew. It's, you know, we can all get coffee together. It's, it's, it's talking about realizing, transcending the limited conceptions of God, becoming like water, becoming bewildered and recognizing God in all of his forms of manifestation and all the forms in which he's worshipped, recognizing the unanimity of desire animating this whole process, seeing God in all of these forms, and therefore your heart then becoming receptive to all these, to all these forms. And then instead of having a straight to and from path, having this bewildered thing where you're just being dragged around by love in a circle, wherever the caravans turn, and the caravans are turning here. So it's just you're just kind of going around circling in in, in love. That's my religion, that's my faith, just like. Pais and Layla, madly in love with each other. Pais and Layla would, would do anything for e each other. And they this kind of extreme love, extreme desire, in which they're totally annihilated, totally consumed in, in, in each other. That's an example of this love. But it's the same love that's animating Pais and Layla, that's animating the people who are seeking God, that's animating all these other lovers. That's animating people who worship whatever they worship. It's the same thing that's animated. And the realization of that is what he's talking about here. Not just like, let's all get along. Yeah. Oh, no, there's, if you get, if you get really into it, the, the six directions, the and then the, 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 the pairing of the things. So the, the gazelles in the meadow, which is wide open and wild. Yeah. Then you have the monastery, which is small, close in for monks, which is human. And then the temple for the idols and the, the, the Kaaba for the pilgrim which is very, very uh, separate. And the other thing too, is the idols are inside the house. The pilgrims are outside the Kaaba. The idols are still in the, in the house. The pilgrims are moving around the Kaaba. Yeah, the Kaaba's got six directions as well too. There's, 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 there's so much crazy stuff in, uh, in, in here. Yeah, because I was in the wilderness and the monks are, yeah, they're in a human constructed monastery which is tight and closed in where the gazelles are open and free. And, but again, it's the heart is the precise way in which you transcend limitations is by being able to 
having the capacity to, again, going back to this capacity idea, having the capacity to accept and recognize all the limitations. So water is not water if it can't, doesn't have the capacity to fit into all limited forms. Right? If it can't fit into a monastery, if it can't fit into a meadow, if it can't fit into any delimited form, whether broad or narrow, whatever, it's not water. It's not truly non-delimited. So this is the kind of realization that Narabi is trying to push us towards. And he's saying, like, this, this, this is what it means to follow the prophet. So go at the beginning. If you love God, then follow me. God will love you. This is what following the prophet looks like. At the beginning, he identified the prophet with love. This is what love looks like. To be a lover is like this. And that's tough, and it's hard. It's it's a lot of work. Um, so the the he loves them, and they love him. When he's describing those people who he loves and who love him, say they jahadu fi sabilillah. They do jihad. They make hard efforts in the path of God. This this is precisely that's what that is. So I'll close with this. In the, in, he has the final poem. He says, "In the sight of people, I am truly a lover, though they know not who my love is for." I'm bewildered. So everybody sees that I'm a lover. Not I, Ibn Arabi. Everybody, like, everybody knows that I'm a lover. They have no idea who my love is for. So any idea they have of him is not him. It's it's him and it's not him. And then as Ibn Arabi always does, I went to close with this uh, verse of the Quran. God speaks the truth and God shows the way. Thank you very much.